Okay, can anybody hear me? <laughs> How do we get the... I think it's working. I can't really hear. We can, okay. Yeah. I can't hear you guys, though. Is that's this a one-way street? Yeah, it is. That's why I'm watching ah. the chat. So, uh, oh, okay. God, I feel like uh, I'm, I'm the only one. I'm on the, I feel like I'm on the radio. Uh, we need to take <laughs> calls. For our first caller, we have a request yeah, for a exactly love song. Our there first caller out, out of Detroit. <laughs> so what's the love song that you're going to sing? The Boys for Love that? Love Song that's been oh. requested. A Yahweh love song. Um. Should we be hearing anything? Can you hear me? Joanna, can you hear me? I guess that means no. No, it takes the chat a second to catch up sometimes. Okay. Do you want to type? You want to be the one typing in there? I can do that. We'll see like these hands just coming in like your hands. I don't know. You can just lean in if you want. I can hear you, but I'm not. Joanna. Nope, you're not. You're Marco. You need a need new teeth. If you cannot hear anything, click on the headphone icon in toolbar above the window. So we should be all set. Clear here. Okay. Ah. You two ready to bend? Sure. V, we are ready whenever you guys are. So I think this is the way this is going to work is that you guys can just chat questions to Stu, and uh, I'll be writing them down on my side. And uh, I'm here, talk. by the way. Hi, guys. That's um. We could talk <laughs> politics. We could talk, like I said, song requests are song fine. Request. Um, love advice. Yep. Love okay. advice to Stu and Lillian. <laughs> we should do the Yahweh love advice. Use lube. That's my advice. <laughs> Completely uncalled for. Sorry. You should have under 18 people, under 18 year olds. Um, well, do you want to ask you some questions first? Sure, we could do that. Kind of start with a little bit of just kind of back and forth here. Um, How do we? Is there any way to know like who our audience is? Yeah, the, the list of people kind of in the, the chat feed there. Um, I think those are only the two. What about the lurkers? Hi, lurkers. Raise your hand if you're a lurker. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I thought that there was a way to see a list, but um, mm. I'm not sure that I There are no lurkers. <laughs> James. I'm not lurking. Thanks, Daniela. Daniela. How's it going? Yes, you were. Oh, you're live blogging. Ooh. Yeah. It's very sexy. <laughs> Just going downhill really fast. <laughs> so uh, let's do a little introduction. So you guys know me. I'm Lillian. Um, you've seen me on that the Insider really, before. That was Lillian's hand. Yep. Uh, this is Stu Levy, the... Uh, CEO and, and what's your, your full title? I'm changing my title. Okay. Did you know at one point I was, my title was janitor on my card, honestly? Are you serious? Yeah. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> After last night, all the cleanup, I, all the cleaning up. I yeah, right, 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 right. That has not changed. I think I'm going to just stick with founder. Maybe, how about founder and filmmaker? What do you think of that? I think I heard, yeah, someone had mentioned that, founder and filmmaker. That. That's I do cool. all kinds of stuff. Yeah. But the janitorial aspect of my job is pretty significant. Yeah, so uh, Stu hosted a, a really nice party for us last night. So we had a bunch of people over to watch the Van 100 movie and all came up to Stu's awesome apartment afterwards just sort of hang out and chat. So it was a really nice nice way to catch up. And Why then did you get in the shot? <laughs> it's weird. It's like, there. There we go. It's a two-shot now. Yeah. We could angle this down a little, too. That's oh, that's true. Although Ooh. I didn't want to show my jeans. Oh, sorry. My jeans. That's all right. I'm going to pretend I was good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm in Tokyo doing meetings with the different publishers here to try and get us exciting new licenses. And I've met with some artists and I've met with Stu to talk about some Princess Eye stuff. So that's why I'm here. We met with Kujirado san yesterday mm -hmm. with, for Princess Eye yep. and our local editor. Right. And we were planning out the third volume of Prism of Midnight Dawn, mm -hmm. and we were also talking about the series, the Princess Eye series, after that. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it was cool, because we, uh, um, Kujirado brought in some cover sketches for volume three, and so we got to kind of talk about those in person. Uh, what's Kujirado sound like? You're going to get to find out, actually, because we, we recorded a really nice interview with her yesterday. So. She was very sweet, yeah. quiet, you know, a lot of artists yeah. tend to be quiet. 
She's quiet, but she's, she's not. Um, but she's gotten to know us, so she's become comfortable. She brought us unagi pie. Yeah. Unagi pie is the local specialty of the Shizuoka Ken, Shizuoka region, mm -hmm. and she lives in Hamamatsu, which is like the real mm -hmm. kind of part of unagi pie territory. Um, what I like about Kujirado is that she has really interesting ideas. So I got to talk to her one on one for a bit while Stu was having another meeting. I'm going to get the unagi pie. Just talking about kind of what she was interested in personally, sort of what her background in manga was. That was really cool. Um, discussing story ideas for Prism and kind of the next Princess side stuff. She, uh, she has really interesting things to say. She's got a great story sense as well. So it's a really fun collaboration. This is the Unagi Pie that she gave <laughs> as a gift. Um, unagi Pie is, it means eel pie, but it's not actually made of eel. It just looks like eel. It's kind of these big, long, flat um, biscuits that look like a piece of kind of broiled eel. We could do like a food show. We could open up the different stuff from Japan, show it to people, we eat could it, and say, like, oh, 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 my shit. Oh, my shit. It's a while. <laughs> well, um, I don't think anybody knows what we're talking about. Uh, I, if Deb's listening, and she knows what we're talking about. Um, if you ever get to see Japanese TV, they do a lot of talk shows where they have like a panel of people who they just do something really inane, like they're eating food, and they have this kind of inane commentary. Um, well, they just say they eat the food and they're like, it was so delicious. It, it was like melting in my mouth. And you're like, okay, that's nice. Um, so what have you been up to lately, Stu? Uh, let's see. Well, a lot of my focus nowadays is, uh, is based on turning Tokyo Pop manga into movies. So on the Tokyo Pop manga side of things, uh, we've got a great team not just Will, but the whole publishing team is, is wonderful, and I can really kind of leave it to them to put out great manga and to try to establish Tokyo Pop in the film side of the business and the television side of the business, and, which is a real big challenge. But, you know, one day we want to hopefully be known for great movies and, and turn these manga into, um, you know, what we call global franchises. So kind of like Marvel. If we can pull off something like an Iron Man or Spider-Man, that sort of thing, based on a Tokyo Pop manga, that would be very cool. So it'll take a bit of time. It's not easy, but that's what I'm focusing on. You've been doing a lot of traveling lately, too, weren't you? In, you were in, yeah. Did you go to Pusan for a while, or were you there for the festival? I was, I was in the film festival in Pusan in Korea. I went to Seoul, and in Seoul it was great. I got to uh, meet, meet up with Park San Sung. Oh, good. Yeah, she's uh -huh. the creator and the manga artist of Tarot Cafe. Mm -hmm. Um, and she is so nice and sweet, and we went to her and then Sophie, who used to be yeah, used to yeah, work yeah. for us, mm -hmm. we went to this amazing um, meal with just all these tiny little Korean delicious dishes mm -hmm. and got to pig out in Korea, which was awesome. I'm, I'm jealous. I did two days in Seoul before I got here, so I spent Thanksgiving in, in Seoul, did. basically, yeah. So did you have turkey kimchi? I had turkey kimchi. Or turkey, turkey bulgogi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was there by myself, and I barely speak any Korean, so... Oh. Um, the, the food was sort of the one thing that I just didn't quite get the great experience on. Cause, like I kept going to places where they had like big, cool, like formal courses and stuff. But it was meant for two people, and I was there alone. And I was like, well, oh, lonely. We could have taken it all in a huge doggy bag back to the States. <laughs> I would have been taking it here first. I don't think the, the uh, Japanese would have liked having like their city no, kimchi on the plane. They would have spoiled yeah. kimchi, mm, bringing yum. it into customs. Yeah. yeah, that you probably would have been busted. I, I was already scared that they were going to stop me for some sort of swine flu related thing. So mm. there's, there's all sorts of stuff in both Korea and Japan right now. It's like wash your hands everywhere and they have all these like sanitation so, stations and stuff. It's crazy. So. so the other place I went, which was really exciting for me personally, is I went to the Middle East for the first time. Really? Yep. I went, oh, right, right, right. Yeah, about a month ago I went mm -hmm. to Jordan. Mm -hmm. And it was my first time in the Middle East. And it was fantastic. Honestly, it was an incredible place. Um, and what was really cool is one of the very last meetings that I had when I was there, I met with a guy who's mm -hmm. making a whole bunch of comics. Mm -hmm. And he, he's taught himself how to draw. He's a storyteller. He's doing um, like Facebook games. And he actually arranged for Nagai Gol, the manga creator, Nagai Gol, to come to Jordan 
and he had, they had a whole big presentation with Nadai Gol wow. the week after I left. Oh no, so you just missed. So it. I was one week. I, I mean, it was great. I got to meet you know the Prince of Jordan, um, Prince Ali, and, and some other great people. But I missed the Nadai Gol in Jordan Bummer. event, which would have been really cool. That would have been cool. But the Middle East is a fast. I mean, so much culture. Obviously, you know, we have this image in the West of the fighting and the wars and this and that, but when you go there, the people are, are so nice, so hospitable. Mm -hmm. I was walking down, down the street and, and a few of us who were on this, this trip, we, we went to a mosque and we were shown the mosque and there was just a guy, an old man walking in front and, you know, full cloth and he was walking in front of the mosque and, um, and, I, and I said, can I take a picture of you? Mm -hmm. And he said, sure. So I took a photo and he actually invited me that night to his house for dinner. Wow. And we were, we were on a trip so yeah. with, with another group, so we couldn't go, but, but he, he's that hospitable. I mean, this old man just invited me to his house for dinner. Yeah. So the people are very, very warm, and, and the country is fascinating. And the fact is, um, the kids are reading manga. Yay! Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think um, we've got a um, couple of questions. We've here. got a couple of manga questions coming in, it looks like. Um, the question was about, uh, we've a lot of the manga titles that we've done in the past are on kind of semi-permanent hiatus. Um, and what's the status of that? Whether the Priest movie moving forward is something that could push these ahead or whether sort of fan requests they're going to draw us at. Um, there's a couple things that might be changing. I, I don't want to say too much yet because I think this, the next six months are going to be interesting in this regard. Obviously, we're doing a lot of stuff um, involving Priest right now. We're going to be re-releasing the series and bind up. We're doing some original comics. A, well, there's a new series. Right. We're coming out with a new series for Priest. Which is going to be super cool. So. Called Priest Purgatory. Priest Purgatory. Have um, we announced that yet? Yeah, we have. Okay. We have. So, but we haven't shown very much of it yet. So keep an eye on the weekly newsletter because Troy is going to be posting a lot of stuff about that soon. Um, the Korean government is super, they, they've always been really enthusiastic about promoting Manwa overseas. And they're doing some really interesting stuff right now um, with um, doing some funding for production and marketing. Um, and depending on sort of what happens with that, you might be seeing some of those Korean titles come back a lot sooner than we were expecting. Um, and there's a few things, not to say too much, but we're, we're getting closer to print on demand right now. And I think that that would also be a, a really great step for Manwa. And for basically any series where we know that demand is out there, but it's going to be very hard to get it into bookstores at this point. Um, that's really the big problem with this. And I, we mentioned this at one of the previous insiders. It's not that we don't want to publish these books, it's that we know that we could print 3,000 copies and only 10 of them would actually end up in Barnes & Noble or Borders because of sort of the way the market is right now with retail. Um, so even if we create the books, actually getting them to you guys is a huge, huge challenge. So we're, we're definitely looking at ways to fix that though. So you know, don't, don't give up hope on those mama titles. Just keep being patient with us for a little bit longer. So. One of the challenges is that if there's a very limited readership for a particular title, right now, the economics, traditionally, the economics mm -hmm. of the publishing business make it so that the expenses of preparing the book right. and the manufacturing costs to get it to a limited readership don't work financially. Yeah. But the technology is improving to the point where it's getting more and more efficient. Yeah. And so really what we're hoping is we're going to be able to deliver titles to a very narrow and limited readership um, without, frankly, having to lose a lot of money doing yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's getting close to that. But one, one issue and one, I guess, question I would have mm -hmm. is one of the main costs is translation costs. Right. But in the meantime, there's become a very um, robust and, and active scanlation community where there's a lot of great fan translators out there. Mm -hmm. And is there a way, I'm just going to ask because you know, we obviously pay our translators and we have a tremendous amount of respect for both the professional translators and for fan translators. Mm -hmm. And so from our point of view, it's not about, you know, doing anything that's unfair, but if we're not in a position to be able to really make the cost work on a title, but a fan wants to translate it, is there a win-win where a fan could translate, we could provide it on POD or something like that, and together we can make something available, and because of that we can achieve a a certain amount of um, managed costs that allow the title to come out. Mm -hmm. So what I'm curious, I know it's kind of a, a little bit of a technical question, mm -hmm. but would fans, any fan fans that just be interested in that? 
as fans in general? Is that something that the fans want to read? Works that were done by fan translators instead of uh, professional translators? Are professional translators angry at that? You know, what? I'm just curious what everybody's view is. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. As, as there is demand for manga out there, but even in terms of sort of the scanlation community, it's a much smaller set of people than sort of the mm -hmm. general the general manga population. Um, right. They're out there, but I mean, if you look at one manga, for example, and sort of look at the manga section of it, you know, there's maybe a dozen titles on that as opposed mm -hmm. to like a hundred that are out there. So right. um, that's representative in my mind both of, maybe there's a little bit of availability issues there as well since most big cities are the Kino Kuniya these days, so you could go and, and buy a Japanese tankobon, but it's a little harder to get copies of manhwa in the U.S. unless you're in like New York or, or probably Los Angeles. Um, There's one group online, a scanlation oriented group, mm -hmm. not a scanlation group, but a, but a site relating to scanlation that I've been talking to uh, the partners of the site. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about, hey, should we try a test? I'm experimenting with ways to work together. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't say who it is because we're just in talks mm -hmm. right now. But, you know, to me, I feel like if there's a way we can all kind of team up and work together, maybe that's part of the future of publishing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, Crunchyroll is an interesting example of that, where they were really a piracy site that kind of went legit. And I don't know how their translation process works and kind of where they're getting those from. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, I'd be curious to learn more about that. So, because yeah. I think they've got, I honestly didn't think that they were going to succeed in that. When I heard that they got that venture capital money, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Um, but I, I've been pretty impressed with what they've done in the last year and a half. So, well, it's interesting to see where they go from here. Well, this kind of a topic is something, if anybody's interested in it, mm -hmm. you know, we're always looking for feedback, but it's something that, you know, I'm starting to explore and, and I'm sure we'll be talking about it more. Mm -hmm. Are there, uh, I haven't seen any, any left. Ugh. Any other questions coming up? So you guys, you know, throw some stuff out there. Are you guys being shy? I, I don't think the <laughs> Tokyo Pop fans are, and manga fans in general are, are known to be a shy bunch. I don't, yeah, I don't usually think of you guys as, uh, okay, what's happening with Vans on Hunter? Ah. <laughs> Thanks, V. Yeah, <laughs> v, thank you. Um, I don't know if, if everybody listening is familiar with Vans on Hunter, but Vans on Hunter was a manga that we published a few years back a very cute series about an evil vanquisher who's mm -hmm. kind of a goofball mm -hmm. and, and somehow saves the day sort of in spite of himself. Mm -hmm. And me and this other guy, Stephen Kalko, who's now a Tokyo Pop guy, we, we sort of went down the, uh, the long and winding road of deciding to turn it into a film. And, mm -hmm. and oh, <laughs> screensaver. Screensaver, Hold on. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so over the past two and a half years, the two of us have written, directed, and we've made this film that is very meta. So Tokyo Pop's in it, we're in it, we're kind of the bad guys, and all this stuff happened. And Van Von Hunter um, is played by the wonderful actor Yuri Lilithal. And so that's finally completed, and now we're prepping to you know, start to put it out on the web and through DVDs and at fan conventions. So over the next six months, you guys will see a lot more of Van Von Hunter. And, you know, it's a crazy film, and it celebrates fan culture. So you, if you guys don't like it, nobody will like it. But <laughs> we made it, and it was kind of just, we had a great time. And whether you guys will enjoy it and appreciate it or not, I don't know. But, um, but I can't wait to see what people think. It was fun to do the screening in L.A. a couple weeks ago. So we, we did the kind of friends and family screening. It was, it was at the, the Goethe Institute, which is right down the street from our office. Um, and that was super neat, and you know everyone there just had a good time. Everyone was laughing in the right spots and stuff. So uh, I'm sure that it was nerve-wracking for Stu and Steven, who were kind of sitting there watching everyone. But uh, yeah, I was a, I'm a first-time director. That was my first movie, so I've, I screwed up plenty of stuff. <laughs> um, but that's okay. I'm pretty much known to screw many things up, so I'm, I'm at least consistent that in the film side of the business, I can screw. Yeah, yeah well. you, you learn from your mistakes. That's the important thing is that we all, you know, as we move forward, you know, make that mistake once and then never again. And that's the way you learn. Looks like we have a question from Deb. We do. Uh, what's happening? Uh, any updates on the Lament of the Land film project? Yes, actually, it, I just had a meeting. That project is taking a long time. Mm -hmm. um, the, the current name for the film version is Love Like Blood. 
Um, but we've gone back and forth with scripts and revisions, and the plan is to have it be directed by myself and uh, a great Japanese director, Takeko Akiyama, uh, who directed a, a film called Hinokio. And Taka and I have gotten to be very close, but in the meantime, as we started to work on the project, some of the challenging elements of that particular story, for instance, there's an incest component, which makes mm -hmm. it very hard, and it's not quite a full vampire story, but at the same time, it's not really a horror story. We, I was a huge fan of the manga, and before I really, I think I know a lot more about film now than I did at the time, mm -hmm. but I thought, God, I've got to make this into a movie because it's such an incredible story. But along the way, I learned the adaptation process, how challenging a lot of mm -hmm. it can be. So we just had a long, huge um, two-day session of revising more about the story. And we're trying to find the right script that, that really takes what's great about the original manga, but adapts it so that it, it fits for a 90-minute you know, film and can hopefully reach a wider audience. Than, than, you know, nowadays, to fund a film, you need to be able to reach a certain size audience. Mm -hmm. And so still in development. Probably it'll take a bit of time, but I um, love it and working on it. It's, it's kind of my personal passion project. So now we have a question about uh, what's up with the wall art behind us, or, or talk about the wall art behind us. Oh, okay, so, really? Uh, yeah, that, and then that. there's another qu then there's a question from Rebecca after that. Okay, so the art, nice question. These pieces here, let's see if we can show them. Um, <laughs> So here's, let's see, how do I do this? Um, it's like I keep getting in it. I'm trying to just show the art. There we go. Can you guys see this? That's okay. one piece. Um, this isn't really, why is it not, not, not working? It goes, oh, it goes it the goes opposite way. way right? <laughs> it's kind of mirror image. There's that piece, and then there's one in the other room. There's a set of three pieces oh. by a Japanese artist named Yoko Tadanori. For anybody who's familiar with with fine art with Jeff. Now we can't sit the other way, huh? Oh, no, um, I'm, I'm, I scooted over, so I'll, be, I'll sit back. Wait, if Let's I put the anatomy pie underneath. No, and boost it up a little bit. No, do that? No. Right. Yes, Yoko Tadanori. These are, these, there's three pieces. It's all part of a three-piece set of Yoko Tadanori. They're 100 uh, print editions. This, these are print 47, I think? Uh, 48. So these prints are print 48 out of 100, and I bought all three pieces, and they're huge. It's kind of hard to tell, but they're almost yeah, as big. Stand up, and you can get some. Uh, well, actually, because the camera's cool. Well, so you have to go against. <laughs> you know, go against it. Um, see, that's how big they are. Yep. So these are huge pieces. Yoko Tadanori is an awesome artist, and they don't really look like traditional Yoko Tadanori work. Um, these were done in the, in the late 80s. Yeah, um, I totally know that you're talking about. That's awesome. Let's see. Very different. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I love his early work, but it, it didn't really match the decor. And so... <laughs> Where did you get them from? From the gallery. Just like in, in Tokyo? In Aoyama. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. Cool. The frames were actually the tough part because they're so big, so framing them was really hard. Hmm. So let's see. So the other um, question was, uh, what were the steps that you took to become the CEO, the CEO of a major of a publisher? publisher? Well, I cheated. I founded the company. <laughs> <laughs> that, Immediately CEO. Yeah, I didn't wow. get I didn't get hired. I think if I applied for a job as CEO anywhere, they'd come in and they'd probably look at my hair and they would like kick me out of the office the moment that I walked in for the interview. But yeah, no, this was Tokyo Pop. I I was in my late twenties and um, basically. Um, living in Tokyo, more or less um, um, subsisting on ramen and um, Aquarius out of Ooh, the, the vending, vending machine, machine. Yeah. and um, and fell in love with anime and manga, and one thing led to another. And at the time, there wasn't really manga in the U.S., so I thought there was a business opportunity, and I was doing um, digital work at the time. I was I was doing um, what they called multimedia. And I was offered a job by Microsoft to wow. run, they were just starting Microsoft Network, MSN. And they offered me to run, to, to basically run Microsoft Network Japan. And that was a very, very attractive job offer. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I was just about to close on my round of seed finding for Tokyo Pop to bring mm -hmm. manga to America. Yeah. So I'm like, work for big 
um, big IT company and made tons of money, um, created a manga, uh, uh, the first manga company to really bring manga to America mm -hmm. and probably make no money. And so I chose the latter. So that's and the background. And you ended up doing really well for yourself. Uh, not really. I mean... <laughs> 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 you have a really nice no, apartment, though. I have a nice place, but so. um, but that's because I have a mortgage. Well, you know, you know, most people have mortgages. That's kind of the way things go. Um, so let's see. What, what are your favorite well, things about Japan? Yeah, I'm writing them down. In the oh, really? It. Yep, yep. I'm keeping track. Okay. So, uh, what are your favorite things about Japan? Food, culture. Um, oh yeah, food. Food is on is the number one. Thing. I mean, most of the people that I know that love Japan and have, and have come here a lot, definitely food is. If it's not number one, it's at least in the top three. It's mm -hmm. very, very hard to not appreciate how awesome the food in Japan is. Agreed. You know, it's, Agreed. it's just, you can walk into an average, just, just around the corner, an average, mediocre Japanese restaurant, and it'll blow away the top Japanese restaurants in the U.S. Yeah, it really doesn't compare. It's, it's interesting. So, I mean, you think that, like, again, sort of the big cities, New York, Boston, Los Angeles, have, like, good sort of vibrant Asian food culture there. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really hard to find that kind of authentic sort of mom-and-pop Japanese-style cooking, which is just everywhere here. So, I mean, you think, you know, I've had sushi before, I've had ramen before, I know what Japanese food is like. There's so much more to it than that. I had some friends that came out and visited uh, a few weeks ago from the States, and it was their first time in Japan, and mm -hmm. so I took them to some places, like, we went drinking. That's the other thing, is when you're in Japan, you go drinking. <laughs> um, I just thought, oh, let me do another app. Let me show, let me show something fun. Um, I did a lot of drinking when I was a, a, a studying abroad here. That was, that was interesting. <laughs> Oh, right, yeah, so, there we go. There so toys, we go. Props, props. Yep. So when you drink, that's, for instance, one of the many, many Japanese beers. Delicious Kirin. So if you drink a lot of this, which you inevitably will do when you're in Tokyo, this is how you prevent yourself from getting a hangover. So this is a drink called Ukon. And Ukon is very, very popular but latte has just come out with nomitomo, and this literally means your drinking friend. <laughs> and they sell them in all the different convenience stores, and you drink one of these before you go drink all of this, and then you drink one of these after you drink a lot of this, and you wake up without a hangover. And the ad is when you go drinking all night long, make sure you have your nomi tomo. <laughs> and, they, and it's like on Japanese TV. Can you imagine in the States, people are like, hey, the next time you're out getting blasted all night, yeah. you know, it just, it's, it's not, it's not the same. Culture. So you're allowed to drink all night long. It's totally socially acceptable. It's also have public transportation, I would say. So the fact that you can, you know, take a cab or take a bus or take a train rather than driving yourself, that, you know. Yeah. Drink responsibly when you're going to be driving. Kids. And this is very tasty. Or don't, don't drink at all. Um, is it? Yeah, that's, that was my question. Is that I've heard that some of those taste like medicine, but... No, this one's really good. Is it? I can give you one you can, you can try. But these, this kind of a thing, I mean, you know, the culture of, of food and drinking mm -hmm. and really enjoying that part of life is, I think, very, very much a part of Japan. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we had a question about what's your favorite title for 2010? Is there anything that you're looking forward to? Well, for me, Priest is such a big thing. Yeah. You know, it's, I've been really involved in Priest in the film. Right. Um, spent a lot of time on the set. Um, really got to know the screenplay writer, the director, mm -hmm. you know, a bunch of other people on the crew, the other producers. So, so I've spent a lot of time with our editor, Troy, mm -hmm. and, um, and now with the writer, as well as Minwu, really banging out the story and getting Scott involved. Scott's the director of the movie. We, it's, it was important to me that the movie side of things, meaning the screenwriter, the director, and then the manga side of, manga side of things, mm -hmm. meaning uh, Minwoo, mm -hmm. that everybody was comfortable with what we're doing. Because mm -hmm. to give you guys a little bit of background, the original manga, for those of you familiar with, with it, is a very long, extensive series that takes place in kind of the historical, historical periods of time. Mm -hmm. So some stuff during the Crusades, most of it during the Old West, like the 1800s, right, right. a little bit in the modern day. But that story is 
different than the story of the film. The screenwriter of the film, um, well, he was attracted to and, and very much a, 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 the, the Minu's work appealed to him, he created a, more of a fantasy world. Mm -hmm. And so he took some of the icons and the strong images from the Mawa, but the actual storyline is totally made up. Mm -hmm. And so what we're doing in this new series is we want to show how the Manwa, what happened in the Manwa actually leads to what happens in the film. We want to do it in a way where it's entertaining and it's not just sort of a historical piece. Right. So we're taking the characters in the film, making them when they're younger, and then incorporating one of the key parts. I'm trying not to give too much away. Yeah. <laughs> incorporating one of the key parts in the original series into this story so that people can start, fans can start to see how these two were connected. Right. And that, it's, it's really a fun process. It's challenging, but it's really mm -hmm. fun. And so this launches, we're actually going to launch it as a monthly comic. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to make sure that it's available to all Western comic fans too. Mm -hmm. So we're launching it as a, as a monthly comic. We're going to launch it as an iPhone app. And mm -hmm. then, of course, we're gonna, our goal is to put out the Tonko Bone um, around Comic-Con time. So when is the first comic straight? Is it like March or April? I think it's April okay. for the monthly, but I'm not 100% not sure. Sounds about That's right. That's a Marco question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I just know that Troy's hard at work on that. So I, I sit in front of him at the office, and so I hear a lot of phone conversations, and like we'll sort of run over story points occasionally. We were talking about the different um, titles for uh, each issue of the, the comic. So when he was kind of working on the outline, he was like, you know, here are the titles that I've got so far. I want them all to kind of be biblically, biblically themed, yep, you know, how yep. to, but also relate each story. So he and I went back and forth on that for a bit. Yeah, yeah. It's a really neat process. So he's, he's a fantastic editor. So um, I hope everybody enjoys it. Hey, I just want to catch up on a couple comments, if you guys don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what our, what our lag is here. There's, there's so many in here now. Um, let's see. Oh, there's one about Japanese artists. Ramen promos lately, I don't know. I can't, I can't answer that, that. I have nothing to do with that. I love ramen, but I, I don't know. That's sort of the, that's the staff. You'll find out in January. That's oh, coming. I know I know what it is. I think you do know what it is. It's, you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You, you do know what it is. We can't say that? We can't say that. All right. It's uh, going to be a special announcement. Some of you might be able to figure it out. It has to do with the title, with a new title. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, then somebody had said... Um, there was something I saw in here. Oh, yeah, passion over money. Yes, passion over money. And you know how, well, how passion over money is possible nowadays? Like, if I make any money at all, because it is nice to make a little bit of money, I spend it on some things like art, or something mm -hmm. that I really love. But one of the reasons why nowadays mm -hmm. money isn't as important is because, like, all my clothes now, I buy at Uniqlo. <laughs> and I love fashion, but Uniqlo yeah. is amazing. It Honestly, is. Like it this is. is Uniqlo too. Uniqlo, this shirt, touch this thing. This is That's it's a lovely like shirt. totally <laughs> soft, and and like I bought all this stuff, these yeah. jeans. This was ten dollars. Oh my god! The jeans that I bought were thirty bucks, yeah. and they're like dyed black, really yeah. cool. Yeah. I mean, the Uniqlo, you can you can be completely poor and be the most fashionable poor person in the world. Yeah, it's kind of like the Gap of Japan if Gap were cool rather than yeah. like boring and preppy. Well, yeah. So. I mean, I wouldn't even use it. <laughs> it's more like H and M, or but but it's I think it's more stylish than H and M even. Yeah, it's not as cheap as H and M. I mean, H and M does things so quickly that like you know you wash it three times and it falls apart. Oh, but I mean, yeah, Uniqlo yeah. stuff is really quality. So I, it's definitely Cindy, the other editor who's here with me. Um, and I are definitely going to be hitting up Uniqlo this weekend to do yes. some shopping. Yes, yes, Uniqlo rocks. Yeah, Uniqlo rocks. It's, it's amazing. And, and I heard, I met up with some guys, I don't know if you guys know Japan Expo, but there's this huge, huge um, convention in Paris every summer called Japan Expo. Mm -hmm. They had 160,000 people last year. Oh, my year. God. Well, the two guys who run it were out mm -hmm. here in Tokyo, and we were at the same conference together. We were actually mm -hmm. both speaking at a, at a conference. And we, we, we met up for lunch, and they told me that Uniqlo, the lines, it's an hour wait to get into the Uniqlo Paris. Oh, my God. On Chandelier. Chandel so That's it's like crazy. the heart of Paris and an hour to get into the shop. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, the manga teas are cool. All right, I think we missed something. First floppy comes on April. V verified that. Tokyo Pop have anything special planned for the Christmas holiday season? 
That's um, better for you and Marco, really. Yeah, I'm I'm going home. <laughs> I'm going back to Boston for Christmas. That's what I have special. I'm going for. to see Muse in concert <laughs> in, in two weeks. Muse, really? Are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah. So, do you guys? Anybody a fan of the band Muse? Oh, yeah. Anybody like Muse? I'm going to see them in um in the joint at the Hard Rock in Vegas. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm oh, really, I'm neat. so psyched. They're good. They're yeah, a good they're band. Good. They're good. Um, I kind of think of them as like Radiohead for idiots, but... They're kind of like Radiohead meets YouTube. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, they're like Radiohead, but they don't make you want to kill yourself when you listen to them, which is the effect that Radiohead has yeah, they're on more, me. They're definitely more, <laughs> more energetic than yeah, Radiohead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, we've got 11 Princess Days of Princess Eye coming up. Princess Eye Volume 2 Prism is coming out at the end of December, so uh, we're going to be doing a lot of teasers yeah. leading up for that. Kujarado signed a bunch of posters for us, so we are already have some of those planned as giveaway prizes, so uh, keep an eye out for that stuff. Yeah, we're now, I'm starting to think of what the next series is going to be about. Mm -hmm. And um, for those of you who follow Princess Eye, the next series we're going to go, we're going to be back to Earth. Yep. So that series will take place on the other side, which is Earth. Mm -hmm. um, and we're going to move away a little bit closer to reality, a little bit further away from the fantasy of PRISM, mm -hmm. um, but hopefully still have a nice little balance. I don't understand um, how you use your computer here. Just, okay. Can you actually click it? Well, the challenge is to catch up with all these other things, right? Because look at all these. Yeah, Deb got I excited lived on about ramen uh, for years. Really slow there. <laughs> yes. Ramen is not a bad thing to live on, although soba is a little bit healthier. Oh, there's an adaptation question about um, adapting uh -huh. film for U.S. audiences. Does it require a lot of change? Oh, and a Korean manga question, too. Um, all right, so Korean manga creators versus Japanese creators. No, it, it's once you're dealing with the creator directly, it all is a, it's all about the relationship. And in the case of Minwoo, he, he was able to fly to LA, mm -hmm. visit the production offices, see all of the incredible concept art. The great thing about Priest mm -hmm. is because of the budget, which was a, a really, really high budget, and there's not any real A-listers in the movie, so mm -hmm. all of the money is going into the production. Everybody involved in the production, from pr the art director to... You know, I mean, just everybody, the DP, mm -hmm. they're the top, the very top of the game. And so the concept art was brilliant. As soon as Mean Lu saw it, he was like, oh, shit. <laughs> you guys do whatever you want. He was just like, you know, I yeah, it to you. So happy. Work. I mean, just beautiful, beautiful That's work. Cool. Um, and it was really a mutual love fest. So, mm -hmm. so and, but I think it's the same thing. We'll see as we do more. You know, I met Kate Tomei K for Love Like Blood, and she was I'm not supposed to say she, huh? I don't know, actually. I don't know. But I think that K, might be Is that old now? That might be. Tommy K was very cooperative and really cool. You know, I think, I think it depends on the person. You know, clearly there's managers and, and publishing companies and people in between who are more product, pr protective. But when you're able to dialogue with the creator directly, I think it helps a lot. Um, um, I don't think we're ever coming to Anime Week in Atlanta. I'm sorry. Um, we've really, really cut back on conventions a lot. No, no, well, next year we have a big thing going on. Wait, we do? Yeah, we oh, haven't announced oh, it. Oh, 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 that. Be, yeah. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, yeah, TV's like, no, we might. I, it will be a little bit before we announce it, but we're yeah. going to be do. Shh, yeah, thanks, Buck up. We're going to be doing something next year that will, I believe, that, you know, we always try to do something innovative and new that other manga companies have never right. done. Next year we will do one. And the thing that we do next year will definitely involve a lot more conventions than ever in the past. So, um, so it should be fun. But that's all we can say right now. Yeah. So maybe, I don't know for sure if Anime Atlanta is on the list, but there's a pretty good chance. It's a convention that we've always heard great things about. So, I mean, it's, it's one that I would certainly want to go to if we ever got the chance. So, but it's possible um, now next year. I think I might, there was one more about like what other sort of art do you like a little further well, up? There's the ad adaptation film for U.S. audience. This is a, a, for me personally it's a fun question. Okay. Um, but I don't know, is this a question? Especially since, uh, yeah. Yeah, the adapta adaptation in general from graphic novels to film and then you throw in another culture like Korea or Japan. Right, right. Priest is a little different because it's not, a, it's not Korean in any way. There's nothing about it that makes it uniquely Korean. Mm -hmm. um, so Priest doesn't have the same issues as 
if we were adapting. Love you know, Like Blood's a great example, actually. Love Like Blood's yeah. a very yeah. good like example, example because the characters mm -hmm. are so submissive. Mm -hmm. and pa Well, passive is the better term. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that's one challenge. But in general with graphic novels, a lot of the challenge is, um, frankly, it's, it's kind of like a novel. A graphic novel is typically one person, maybe two at the most, working on something that's very personal to them. And they have the advantage of monologue. Mm -hmm. So you can get into the character's head, mm -hmm. especially in a shoujo manga. Yeah. Whereas when you're in a film, you can have VO. It's not something that, in general, filmmakers like to do. It's kind of a crutch. If it's mm -hmm. used creatively, then that's fine. But using too much VO can really um, destroy the experience from an audience point of view. Right. So adapting to that format where you don't have the monologue, um, another challenge is you have 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. You have people sitting in their chair and you've got to be able to keep them interested for this 90 minute period and you've got to show an arc. You have to have your character something happen during that time. So um, in a graphic novel you have a certain amount of, you have more time and you can control time mm -hmm. a little bit easier I think on the page than you can on the screen. You have a lot more space to work with at least. So I mean that's, that's really like, you think about uh, you know, manga series can run anywhere from one to 400 volumes. So, you know, what, what part of that story do you adapt from? What kind of do you work with? So, I think that's, that's an interesting challenge. It's easy to kind of look at comics or to look at manga as being kind of a, a storyboard for a movie, but, and that does work in some ways, uh, particularly anime will do that a lot, where they almost do like frame by frame. They'll kind of pull from the original graphic novel, but, or Frank Miller with Sin City. It, it's possible to do that. But I think that's the exception rather than the rule. Yeah, it, so. it depends on the graphic novel. But, right. you know, at the end of the day, that's part. Filmmaking, the biggest challenge is it's a, you're, you're, you've got a lot more money on the line. Right. And right. so your investors, whoever they are, whether it's a major Hollywood studio or fin independent financiers, you know, they're, they're, they know that your film has to reach way more people than you can get away mm -hmm. with as a graphic novel. So how do you reach a wider audience is part of the, the challenge. Mm -hmm. It's harder to tell nichier stories, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you can't just copy you know, a successful film. You have to right. be unique. You need so, your own voice, your own vision. Yeah, it's that so. balance. Um, does Tokyo Pop have anything planned for the young kids set five to eight? Not really. Um, we, there, I know how much buzz there is on the internet about sort of more comics for kids and sort of what that's all about. It's a really challenging market, and again, it's both internal resources and having someone who really knows that audience and is, you know, has experience speaking to that audience, and it's a distribution problem. You, you're selling to an entirely different part of the bookstore if you're working with stuff from, you know, kids five to eight. You can't just stick it in the manga section because then your, your you know, first grader is going to walk in and pick up Battle Royale instead of Card Cap or Sakura, and then you're going to have a real problem on your hands. Um, so it's a very complicated issue. Um, if we're talking direct market, that might be a little bit different, but yeah, that's, that's not really on our radar right now, I would say. Um, so about the youngest we get is sort of nine and up. So, right. and, and that's something that... It may change in the future, but right now that's... that's yeah, it's, it's, it's a diverse company. It's something I'm sure we'd love to do more of. We've tried to do stuff in the past, but yeah. I think it really requires a huge commitment of sort of resources and, and labor. Um, and we've got other things we're focusing on right now. Right. So. We, we, we have tried some of those types of books before, mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately at the time at least, comics weren't easy to be accepted. Maybe that's changing right. over time right. and maybe someone who is more experienced and has the trust of parents and teachers. That's the other thing is when you're yeah. dealing with a five yeah. to eight year old market, you sell to teachers and you sell to parents. Mm -hmm. when, you're selling, when you're selling manga, you're selling to a 14 year old or an 18 year old, right. somebody directly, the consumer. Yeah. So selling to parents and to teachers is a different business that we, Tokyo Pop, frankly, just have never done before. And yeah. it's, it's, it's harder. Well, it's, it's harder because you can't do, it's hard to do both, I'd right. say. Right, right. When we were doing Cinemanga, it was easy because we were working with big brands there. So, I mean, we had Avatar, we had Spongebob, we had Lizzie McGuire. That was right. stuff that's like... Parents know about those brands. Right. It's, it's the brands that they were buying rather than the fact that it was Cinemanga or Tokyo Pop. So, um, right. But that's, that's, even that market has kind of dried up a little bit, so. But, you know, you never know. We're always, I'm an entrepreneur, so I love to try new stuff. <laughs> and so. He likes to keep us on our toes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've got to try things. 
there was some question in here uh, about oh, about the oh yeah um, yeah uh -huh. um, where'd it go we had it there a second ago uh, does it bother you at all that so many Tokyo Pop OEL manga creators are somewhat dot 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 comma well bitter about their experiences um, it totally bothers me personally I think it's really too bad because we well, there's, first of all, let me say there's plenty of, uh, I believe there's plenty of manga creators that enjoy their experience. Yeah. Am I wrong about that? I, I don't think so. I think that there's a lot of people yeah. who, you know, or at least have, have a, uh, a realistic perspective on it. Yeah, you know, we, we tried to make, um, we try to support manga creators, and I think, and we still do, but the challenge is, one, we put a lot of financial investment into it, and I believe that the manga creators, some of them, maybe the ones who are more bitter, don't quite understand how much of a risk that was mm -hmm. and how much of an investment we made. Mm -hmm. And um, part of the challenge of that is almost all of that investment we haven't made back, yeah. even now. Um, we were hoping that the manga audience would be a little bit more open-minded, to be honest, and mm -hmm. trying different kinds of cultural perspectives, different types of, pro types of product. I think when you call something manga, the definition of manga in the States, what manga means in English and what manga means in Japan is very, very different. And because I spent so much time in Japan, I personally always assumed that the English version of manga was the same as ja Japanese, which is more all-encompassing. Mm -hmm. um, but in the States, it meant a very specific thing, you know, a look that's kind of like everybody imagines a Japanese-style manga to be like. And yeah. that means more the, the anime-style manga. Yeah. Um, but in reality, there's all kinds of manga, and we just assumed that, hey, if we're doing different kinds of graphic novels, because we're Tokyo Pop, we're just calling them manga in the way that in Japan everything's called manga, but that was very much misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, that's, the fan base wasn't able to, they weren't willing to try different things for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, it's not just U.S. creators, too, or like non-Japanese creators. I mean, there's a question that we're going to get to at some point about Jose and kind of older like seinen type comics, um, even those don't really have much of a following in the U.S. There's people who love them, and there's people who are really devoted to them and keep asking us for them. But you guys are a minority, and you have to kind of understand that. And we're, we're doing our best to kind of keep the market diverse and keep that out there. But the same people who didn't read Dog Beer are the same people who are not reading Supply. And at the same time, there's certain um, OEL um, titles that we've made that um, have done quite well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the support... Even just sort of in the course of working on something like DramaCon, from the time that I started working with Svet to the time that Volume 1 came out to the time that Volume 2 came out, people went from saying, you know, non-Japanese people can't draw manga to, of course they can. You know, mm -hmm. there's people who are doing it. There's people who are doing stuff that I think is really cool. Um, it's and just there, weren't, there aren't quite enough of them yet. <laughs> well, to me, there, I never really distinguished much the difference between say, what people call manga and what people call graphic novels yeah. or Western comics, I treated it all as sequential art. And right. to me, the word manga meant all of that. Yeah. And, you know, certainly there's stylistic differences in general, but there's exceptions to those rules too. Yeah. Um, so we at Tokyo Pop, we were publishing sequential art, mm -hmm. and we still do. And so whether the Western audience crowd will ever, Western comic audience will ever accept the things we publish as stuff that they like, or whether the traditional manga audience will ever accept some of the quote-unquote non-manga stuff that yeah. we publish. I don't know, but personally, as like a music fan that loves all kinds of genres, yeah. or a film fan that loves all kinds of genres, and of course as a comic fan that does, I think people should try their hardest to be a little bit more open-minded mm -hmm. and at least experiment. Ultimately, if you find the things you love and you stick with those, that's great. Yeah. But at least have a little bit of an open mind and try some different things. Mm -hmm. You don't want to eat, you know, steak and potatoes every night. <laughs> so that, that would be my personal view. As for kind of the creator relations question, I mean, I think we really try pretty hard to kind of keep on good terms with our creators. And it's, it's been obviously a hugely challenging market for the last few years. And there's people who I know that we have, you know, personally disappointed. And that's, that's something that's difficult for an editor, something that's difficult for you know, a founder and creative officer because, um, you know, we're creative people ourselves and there, there's the passion involved um, that's just that's difficult to deal with. But, I mean, we're really doing our best to kind of complete series to try and get things out there at least somehow. Um, there's stuff in the works, like I said, that hopefully will make people happy in the next few months. Um, 
but there's also the recognition that not everyone's going to be happy. I think so. the most important point that I'd like to make for, th for this, and maybe not everybody's interested in this, mm -hmm. this conversation, is that any contractual commitments that we've ever had to any authors, we've always kept them. Yes. We have never once violated a contract that we had. Yes. So there's other publishers, if they're not doing well, there's a challenging time, they would break their contract or not make payments. We never have ever done that. Yes. And the, when series were, if they were ever cut mid-series, it was mm -hmm. contractually what we were able to do. Yes. It was not that we had committed to contractually a, a volume and that we canceled that somehow mm -hmm. and we violated a contract. We've never ever done that. Mm -hmm. And in terms of cutting series mid-series, we try our hardest not to do that. But if mm -hmm. something's losing lots of money, what do you do? Um, mm -hmm. Somebody asked me, at Comic-Con we had a little bit of a conference mm -hmm. right, right. With, with, um, with our creators and somebody asked me, because for those of you who don't know, I also write. Mm -hmm. I don't do it that often, but I do it sometimes. And, and in the comic world, I use the pen name DJ Milky sometimes. And somebody said, hey, how, you know, what does DJ Milky feel about this stuff? And, and I said, which is the truth, I said, hey, DJ Milky got his series cut. Mm -hmm. DJ Milky, me, I wrote a series called Karma Club. It was actually an illustrated novel series. Mm -hmm. And after the first volume, it was a five-volume series. The second volume was com completely done, mm -hmm. completely written. The third, fourth, and fifth volume summaries were written, mm -hmm. and it got cut after the first volume by Tokyo Pop. <laughs> so, you know, that's life. If your series is really bombing, the company has an obligation to do their best, but there is a point where it sort of unfortunately didn't work. It's like TV yeah. shows get canceled, things like that happen, and we all got to get beyond that and try our best to make the next thing be more commercially successful. Mm -hmm. And as creators, I think that that's a responsibility we have to have too. Mm -hmm. um, when you get closer to print on demand, uh, will the company again attempt to go for a more diverse catalog? That is certainly the hope. So um, just as you know, we were saying that we've, we've always fulfilled our contractual obligations to uh, OGM creators, we also do that with the Japanese companies as much as we possibly can. Um, so when we say that things are on hiatus, they really are on hiatus. You know, there's very few things that you will never see the end of. Um, and POD is, is, would be a great way to kind of keep doing that. So. Um, I think that covers a lot of this stuff. Any new contests? Keep an eye on the newsletter for new contests. Ten more um, minutes. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's really the place where we kind of announce all of that and keep track of that. So I mean, we're... Kasha over on the other end in, in Los Angeles is doing an amazing job organizing that newsletter. So, you know, that really is kind of our way of, of handling new content every week. And the, and the big thing for next year that we mentioned that would be the innovative thing that we're going to do. Yeah. I, no, I noticed the comment about swag. Yeah. Swag will be involved with that. It's going to be way cooler than just doing live webcams at the con. Trust me. So, because yeah. uh, there, there's another question about that. I'm like, no, 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 no. That, that's, you know. Wow, here's a long one. A new Whoa. person, Olga. Hey, Olga. How's it going? Do you have any plans on creating a monthly format at some point, a little like EM Plus, which might help sort through new authors? Anything that we, well, I, I would not say no automatically to anything, but I'll tell you, I don't know how EM Plus is doing from a, from a financial point of view, right. but printing a magazine in that whole paper print <laughs> format. He, he's fondling a magazine right now, which you can't see on camera there. <laughs> If you haven't seen what a magazine looks like, a here, magazine. Here. A magazine. A magazine with yeah. paper, and it's amazing how you can yeah. actually touch it. This one happens to be called L. Um, this format's dying. Um, it's this, been a really it, interesting, like. It's very hard now to yeah. sell these things. Yeah. And um, it's sad. Yeah. Don't think I'm not sad about it. Uh, don't, aren't I sad? You're very sad. See, I'm, I'm sad. I'm sad. Yeah. But you know, our our lovely paper magazine mm -hmm. format is not financially very viable anymore. Yes. So, so what about a digital format? It's a follow-up question. Digital format? Yeah. Great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Great idea. Um, um, Olga, Olga, Olga you like you. You're smart. She is. She's awesome. Um, yeah. I think that online and with, you know, iPhone, with, you know, new, all the new devices, not just the Kindle, but all the new things coming out, there's a lot of opportunity to play with that sort of thing, whether it's exactly the same as a magazine, as a print magazine, a digital version, or mm -hmm. something that takes more advantage of the, the medium itself. Yeah. Um, it's hard to say. Personally, yeah. I think things will evolve and the way that stuff will be presented, will, content will be presented, will be more 
um, um, customized to that format. Yeah. But certainly, these platforms open up a lot of great opportunities. Yeah. So wait and see. There, there's nothing concrete with that yet, but it's certainly something that we consider anytime we have one of these discussions. So. Um, one question that comes up a lot from fans is when will the next volume of such and such come out? Keep an eye on the newsletter. That's where we do a lot of announcements like that. Um, uh, have you considered being more transparent about the status of current series? I think we're about as transparent as we can be. I mean, uh, we... Uh, Are we not? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm always kind of baffled by that because I'm like, we, we schedule things six months out, which means that our catalog is basically, you can figure out from Amazon and other sources what we're going to be publishing through at least late spring 2010. Um, beyond that, we have most of the rest of 2010 kind of planned out internally, but you know, we're waiting for licenses to come through. We don't approval, approval that. things, things move around a little bit after it's not that. All, it's, most so. of it's not entirely in our control, so right. for instance, if we, made our, if we announced our entire 2010 and 2011 schedule now, it's going to shift around a little. Ninety-five percent so. chance those things would change, and so it's just going to be misleading to people. Uh, I see. So the, the follow-up question is: People want a list on the website of everything that's been postponed, etc. Um, that's something that we might consider doing. Um, at least, sort of. I mean, again, if you sort of go to individual series, then at least we're listing through kind of current volumes. Um, I guess the question is: Do we cancel? Are we canceling a certain series? Are we thinking about it and we don't know yet what we're going to do? Right. Or are we definitely going to publish the next volume, we just haven't clarified when? Something right. like that? Is that what you guys are talking about? Yeah. I would assume so. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, personally, I don't have a problem with doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's a legal reason why we haven't. I guess we'd have to ask our, our legal department. But there might be some licensor relations. So could have to do with I mean, the honestly, Japanese we're still licensor. discussing with them sort of what the status on some of these series is. But I mean, we have brought a lot of stuff back in the last six months as well. So I mean, if you've been following these, these insiders, um, you know, we've, we've brought back a bunch of series from Mad Garden. Uh, we brought back Shuffley. It's taking a while for this to get out, but... Uh, I mean, a lot of this honestly has to do with, with money. When the market fell, when the bottom fell out of the market last mm -hmm. year at retail, a lot, all of the companies, not just us, Viz, everybody, mm -hmm. um, scrambled because mm -hmm. a, most of the titles that were selling a certain amount dropped down to nothing or they all got returned or all these things happened. And so we've had to figure out what is viable financially or not. You know, I, I personally think print on demand will help a lot of this stuff mm -hmm. because if there's 500 people or 2,000 people or a certain amount of people that love a certain series and they can't find it in a bookstore or, yeah. you know, we were just talking about this, but book distribution is so inefficient, it ends up in Alaska, Barnes & Noble, and the person who wants it lives in Nebraska, that's a very inefficient system. Mm -hmm. So we believe over the next couple of years, even if the series right now has been postponed, there's ways that we can introduce it to an audience. Will a fan wait that long? I don't know. But the reality of the day-to-day -day at retail makes it impossible. It's not just in our control. They have a shelf um, that they control and they have to decide what to buy and what not to buy. Uh, but in general, I don't think it's a bad idea to, uh, to say, hey, this is one that we're not sure about yet. And for now, it's postponed and we'd love to bring it back. And, um, you know, we're doing everything we can and hopefully it'll work out. This one, we're definitely going to publish um, either here's when the next volume is or we don't know yet, but we're definitely going to publish it. That bit of information, you know, if we haven't announced it like that, it's probably, frankly, because the poor team is so busy, they just haven't gotten to it, but it's not like they, per, you know, purposely hold, held back on stuff, right? No, I, I don't, I think we're always as basically as transparent as we can possibly be. That's something that we've always tried to do, whether it's dealing with the Japanese or whether it's dealing with the Americans. It's something that we actually, um, again, going around to these licensor meetings that people really appreciate from us is that we were pretty upfront about kind of our financial condition a year and a half ago and said, you know, this is sort of the reality of things. This is how we're going to deal with it. We laid out our plans. And I think that that really assures people. So, okay. you know, and that's, you know, anytime you guys have a question, this is, this insider is the format when you can kind of come and ask it too. So. Yeah, and, and I think that this kind of a um, recommendation or suggestion, we should take it back. I think, Marco, yeah, you guys are listening. So yeah. on the web, can we say the series that, you know, which series we're, we're not sure about yet, which one, you know, that type of information that we just discussed, if you guys can look into that, that'd be great. Um, yeah. And hopefully we can, we can implement that. 
I'll, I'll tell you guys just, this is not a specific question, but just so you guys know, because we haven't spoken, you haven't had an insider with me, um, I've read some stuff, you know, whether it's on Twitter or whatever, where people say like, oh, Tokyo Pop, they died or this happened or whatever. Um, that's, we, we, do, we are not, we don't go away. It was greatly exaggerated. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm a really... <laughs> Give me what Pat's done. What are you talking about? <laughs> Did, that, did we finish the series? Yeah, we finished the series. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Okay. I, just I was just going to say that, um, <laughs> that, you know, I've always tried my hardest to be aggressive and flexible and um, really do what's needed to do for the company to survive and thrive yeah. and, and lead. And, um, you know, last year was really, really hard, but, you know, I was never giving up. Mm -hmm. And I'm just... I don't know. I'm not that kind of person. I work all the time and... Boy, does he ever. <laughs> and, you know, there's always something out there. There's always new ideas. There's always something yeah. to try. And so it's a question of whether people believe in you or not. So yeah. if you guys keep believing in us and the things we can do, we can always try new things that somebody else hasn't done yet. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to stay one step ahead. Although I don't think we're ever going to be able to do contests for outside of the United States because there's a lot of legal issues with that. Oh, really? So, yeah.